One time, the little hen and the little rooster went to Nut Mountain, and they agreed that whoever would find a nut would share it with the other one. Now the little hen found a large, large nut, but wanting to eat the kernel by herself, she said nothing about it. However, the kernel was so thick that she could not swallow it down. It got stuck in her throat, and fearing that she would choke to death, she cried out, Little rooster, I beg you to run as fast as you can to the well and get me some water, or I'll choke to death. The little rooster ran to the well as fast as he could and said, Well, give me some water, for the little hen is lying on Nut Mountain. She swallowed a large nut kernel and is about to choke to death on it. The well answered, First, run to the bride and get some red silk from her. The little rooster ran to the bride. Bride, give me some red silk, and I'll give the red silk to the well, and the well will give me some water, and I'll take the water to the little hen who is lying on Nut Mountain. She swallowed a large nut kernel, and is about to choke to death on it. The bride answered, First, run to my wreath. I got it caught on a willow branch. So the little rooster ran to the willow and pulled the wreath from its branch, and took it to the bride. And the bride gave him some red silk which he took to the well, which gave him some water. And the little rooster took the water to the little hen. But when he arrived, she had already choked to death, and she lay there dead, and did not move at all. The little rooster was so sad, that he cried aloud, and all the animals came to mourn for the little hen. Six mice built a small carriage, which was to carry the little hen to her grave. When the carriage was finished, they hitched themselves to it, and the little rooster drove. On the way they met a fox. Where are you going, little rooster? I'm going to bury my little hen. May I ride along? Yes, but you must sit at the rear, because my little horses don't like you too close to the front. So he sat at the rear, and then the wolf, the bear, the elk, the lion, and all the animals in the forest. They rode on until they came to a brook. How can we get across? said the little rooster. A straw was lying there next to the brook, and he said, I'll lay myself across, and you can drive over me. But just as the six mice got onto the straw, it slipped into the water, and the six mice all fell in and drowned. They did not know what to do, until a coal came and said, I'm large enough. I will lay myself across, and you can drive over me. So the coal laid itself across the water, but unfortunately it touched the water, hissed, and went out, and it was dead. A stone saw this happen, and wanting to help the little rooster, it laid itself across the water. The little rooster pulled the carriage himself. He nearly reached the other side with the dead little hen. But there were too many others seated on the back of the carriage, and the carriage rolled back, and they all fell into the water and drowned. Now the little rooster was all alone with the dead little hen. He dug a grave for her, and laid her inside. Then he made a mound on top, and sat on it, and grieved there for so long that he too died, and everyone was dead. A blood sausage and a liver sausage had been friends for some time, and the blood sausage invited the liver sausage for a meal at her house. At dinner time the liver sausage merrily set out for the blood sausage's house, but when she walked through the doorway she saw all kinds of strange things. There were many steps, and on each one of them she found something different. There was a broom and a shovel fighting with each other, a monkey with a big wound on its head, and more such things. The liver sausage was very frightened and upset by this. Nevertheless, she took heart, entered the room, and was welcomed in a friendly way by the blood sausage. The liver sausage began to inquire about the strange things on the stairs, but the blood sausage pretended not to hear her, or made it seem it was not worth talking about. Or she said something about the shovel and the broom, such as, That was probably my maid gossiping with someone on the stairs. And she shifted the topic to something else. Then the blood sausage said she had to leave the room and go into the kitchen, and look after the meal. She wanted to check to see if everything was in order, and nothing had fallen into the ashes. The liver sausage began walking back and forth in the room, and kept wondering about the strange things until someone appeared, I don't know who it was, and said, Let me warn you, liver sausage, you're in a bloody murderer's trap. You'd better get out of here quickly, if you value your life. 
The liver sausage did not have to think twice about this. She ran out of the door as fast as she could. Nor did she stop until she got out of the house and was in the middle of the street. Then she looked around and saw the blood sausage standing high up in the attic window with a long, long knife that was gleaming as though it had just been sharpened. The blood sausage threatened her with it and cried out, If I had caught you, I would have had you. There was once on a time a poor man, who could no longer support his only son. Then said the son, Dear father, things go so badly with us that I am a burden to you. I would rather go away and see how I can earn my bread. So the father gave him his blessing, and with great sorrow took leave of him. At this time the king of a mighty empire was at war, and the youth took service with him, and with him went out to fight, and when he came before the enemy, there was a battle, and great danger, and it rained shot until all his comrades fell on all sides, and when the leader also was killed, those left were about to take flight, but the youth stepped forth, spoke boldly to them, and cried, We will not let our fatherland be ruined. Then the others followed him, and he pressed on and conquered the enemy. When the king heard that he owed the victory to him alone, he raised him above all others, gave him great treasures, and made him the first in the kingdom. The king had a daughter who was very beautiful, but she was also very strange. She had made a vow to take no one as her lord and husband, who did not promise to let himself be buried alive with her if she died first. If he loves me with all his heart, she said, of what use will life be to him afterwards? On her side she would do the same, and if he died first, would go down to the grave with him. This strange oath had up to this time frightened away all wooers, but the youth became so charmed with her beauty that he cared for nothing but asked her father for her. But dost thou know what thou must promise? said the king. I must be buried with her, he replied. If I outlive her, but my love is so great that I do not mind the danger. Then the king consented, and the wedding was solemnized with great splendor. They lived now for a while, happy and contented with each other, and then it befell that the young queen was attacked by a severe illness, and no physician could save her. And as she lay there, dead, the young king remembered what he had obliged to promise, and was horrified at having to lie down alive in the grave. But there was no escape. The king had placed sentries at all the gates, and it was not possible to avoid his fate. When the day came when the corpse was to be buried, he was taken down into the royal vault with it, and then the door was shut and bolted. Near the coffin stood a table on which were four candles, four loaves of bread, and four bottles of wine, and when the provisions came to an end, he would die of hunger, and now he sat there full of pain and grief, ate every day only a little piece of bread, drank only a mouthful of wine, and nevertheless saw death daily drawing nearer. Whilst he thus gazed before him, he saw a snake creep out of the corner of the vault, and approach the dead body, and as he thought it came to gnaw at it, he drew his sword and said, As long as I live, thou shalt not touch her, and hewed the snake in three pieces. After a time a second snake crept out of a hole, and when it saw the other lying dead and cut into pieces, it went back, but soon came again with three green leaves in its mouth, then leaves on each wound. Immediately the severed parts joined themselves together. The snake moved and became alive again and both of them hastened away together. The leaves were left lying on the ground, and a desire came into the mind of the unhappy man, who had been watching all of this, to know if the wondrous power of the leaves which had brought the snake to life again could not likewise be the service to a human being. So he picked up the leaves and laid one of them on the mouth of his dead wife, and the two others on her eyes. And hardly had he done this, than the blood stirred in her veins rose into her pale face and coloured it again. Then she drew breath, opened her eyes and said, Ah, God, where am I? 
Thou art with me, dear wife, he answered, and told her how everything had happened, and how he had brought her back again to life. Then he gave her some wine and bread, and when she had regained her strength, he raised her up, and they went to the door and knocked, and called so loudly that the sentries heard it, and told the king. The king came down himself and opened the door, and there he found both strong and well, and rejoiced with them that now all sorrow was over. The young king, however, took the three snake leaves with him, gave them to a servant, and said, Keep them for me carefully, and carry them constantly about thee. Who knows in what trouble they may yet be a service to us. A change had, however, taken place in his wife. After she had been restored to life, it seemed as if all love for her husband had gone out of her heart. After some time, when he wanted to make a voyage over the sea to visit his old father, and they had gone on board a ship, she forgot the great love and fidelity which he had shown her, and which had been the means of rescuing her from death, and conceived a wicked inclination for the skipper. And once when the young king lay there asleep, she called in the skipper, and seized the sleeper by the head, and the skipper took him by the feet, and thus they threw him down into the sea. When the shameful deed was done, she said, Now let us return home, and say that he died on the way. I will extol and praise thee, so to my father that he will marry me to thee, and make thee the heir to his crown. But the faithful servant who had seen all that they did, unseen by them, unfastened a little boat from the ship, got into it, sailed after his master, and let the traders go on their way. He fished up the dead body, and by the help of the three snake leaves, which he carried about him, and laid on the eyes and mouth, he fortunately brought the young king back to life. They both rode with all their strength day and night, and their little boat flew so swiftly that they reached the old king before the others did. He was astonished when he saw them come alone, and asked what had happened to them. When he learned of the wickedness of his daughter, he said, I cannot believe that she had behaved so ill, but the truth will soon come to light, and bade both go into the secret chamber and keep themselves hidden from everyone. Soon afterwards the great ship came sailing in, and the godless woman appeared before her father, with a troubled countenance. He said, Why dost thou come back alone? Where is thy husband? Ah, dear father! she replied. I come home again in great grief. During the voyage, my husband came suddenly ill and died, and if the good skipper had not given me his help, it would have gone ill with me. He was present at his death, and can tell you all. The king said, I will make the dead alive again, and opened the chamber, and bade the two come out. When the woman saw her husband, she was thunderstruck and fell on her knees and begged for mercy. The king said, There is no mercy. He was ready to die with thee, and restored thee to life again. But thou hast murdered him in his sleep, and shalt receive the award that thou deservest. Then she was placed with her accomplice in the ship, which had been pierced with holes, and sent out to sea, where they soon sank amid the waves. Once upon a time, a mouse, a bird, and a sausage formed a partnership. They kept a house together, and for a long time they lived in peace and prosperity, acquiring many possessions. The bird's task was to fly into the forest every day to fetch wood. The mouse carried water, made the fire, and set the table. The sausage did the cooking. Whoever is too well off always wants to try something different. Thus, one day, the bird chanced to meet another bird, who boasted to him about his own situation. This bird criticised him for working so hard, while the other two enjoyed themselves at home. For, after the mouse had made the fire and carried the water, she could sit in the parlour and rest until it was time for her to set the table. The sausage 
had only to stay by the pot, watching the food cook. When mealtime approached, she would slither through the porridge or the vegetables, and thus everything was greased and salted, and ready to eat. The bird would bring his load of wood home. They would eat their meal, and then sleep soundly until the next morning. It was a great life. The next day, because of his friend's advice, the bird refused to go to the forest, saying that he had been their servant for long enough. He was no longer going to be a fool for them. Everyone should try a different task for a change. The mouse and the sausage argued against this, but the bird was the master, and he insisted that they give it a try. The sausage was to fetch wood, the mouse became the cook, and the bird was to carry the water. And what was the result? The sausage trudged off towards the forest, the bird made the fire, and the mouse put on the pot and waited for the sausage to return with the wood for the next day. However, the sausage stayed out so long that the other two feared that something bad had happened. The bird flew off to see if he could find her. A short distance away he came upon a dog that had seized the sausage as free booty and was making off with her. The bird complained bitterly to the dog about this brazen abduction, but he claimed that he had discovered forged letters on the sausage and that she would thus have to forfeit her life to him. Filled with sorrow, the bird carried the wood home himself and told the mouse what he had seen and heard. They were very sad, but were determined to stay together and make the best of it. The bird set the table while the mouse prepared the food. She jumped into the pot, as the sausage had always done, in order to slither and weave in and about the vegetables and grease them. But before she reached the middle, her hair and skin were scalded off, and she perished. When the bird wanted to eat, no cook was there, beside himself. He threw the wood this way and that, called out, looked everywhere, but no cook was to be found. Because of his carelessness, the scattered wood caught fire, and the entire house was soon aflame. The bird rushed to fetch water, but the bucket fell into the well, carrying him with it and he drowned. Once upon a time, there lived a nightingale and a blind worm, each with one eye. For a long time, they lived together peacefully and harmoniously in a house. However, one day, the nightingale was invited to a wedding, and she said to the blind worm, I've been invited to a wedding, and I don't particularly want to go with one eye. Would you be so kind as to lend me yours? I'll bring it back to you tomorrow. The blind worm gave her the eye out of the kindness of her heart. But when the nightingale came home the following day, she liked having two eyes in her head and being able to see on both sides. So she refused to return the borrowed eye to the blind worm. Then the blind worm swore that she would avenge herself on the nightingale's children and the children of her children. Well, replied the nightingale, see if you can find me. I'll build my nest in the linden, so high, so high, so high. You'll never be able to find it no matter how hard you try. Ever since that time, all the nightingales have had two eyes, and all the blind worms, none. But wherever the nightingale builds her nest, a blind worm lives beneath it, in the bushes, and constantly tries to crawl up the tree, pierce the eggs of her enemy, and drink them up.
Three army surgeons, who thought they knew their art perfectly, were travelling about the world, and they came to an inn where they wanted to pass the night. The host asked whence they came, and whither they were going. We are roaming about the world, and practising our art. Just show me for once in a way what you can do, said the host. Then the first said he would cut off his hand, and put it on again early next morning. The second said he would tear out his heart, and replace it next morning. The third said he would cut out his eyes, and heal them again next morning. If you can do that, said the innkeeper, you have learned everything. They, however, had a salve, with which they rubbed themselves, which joined parts together, and they carried the little bottle, in which it was, constantly with them. Then they cut the hand, heart, and eyes from their bodies, as they had said they would, and laid them all together on a plate, and gave it to the innkeeper. The innkeeper gave it to a servant, who was to set it in the cupboard, and take good care of it. The girl, however, had a lover in secret, who was a soldier. When, therefore, the innkeeper, the three army surgeons, and everyone else in the house were asleep, the soldier came and wanted something to eat. The girl opened the cupboard and brought him some food, and in her love forgot to shut the cupboard door again. She seated herself at the table by her lover, and they chatted away together. While she sat so contently there, thinking of no ill luck, the cat came creeping in, found the cupboard open, took the hand and heart and eyes of the three army surgeons, and ran off with them. When the soldier had done eating, and the girl was taking away the things and going to shut the cupboard, she saw that the plate which the innkeeper had given her to take care of was empty. Then she said in a fright to her lover, Ah, miserable girl, what shall I do? The hand is gone, the heart and the eyes are gone too. What will become of me in the morning? Be easy, said he. I will help thee out thy trouble. There is a thief hanging outside on the gallows. I will cut off his hand. What hand was it? The right one. Then the girl gave him a sharp knife, and he went and cut the poor sinner's right hand off, and brought it to her. After this, he caught the cat and cut its eyes out, and now nothing but the heart was wanting. Have you not been killing, and are not the dead pigs in the cellar? said he. Yes, said the girl. That's well, said the soldier, and he went down and fetched a pig's heart. The girl placed all together on the plate, and put it in the cupboard, and when after this her lover took leave of her, she went quietly to bed. In the morning, when the three army surgeons got up, they told the girl she was to bring them the plate, on which the hand, heart and eyes were lying. Then she brought it out of the cupboard, and the first fixed the thief's hand on, and smeared it, with his salve, and it grew to his arm directly. The second took the cat's eyes, and put them in his own head. The third fixed the pig's heart firm in the place where his own had been, and the innkeeper stood by and admired their skill, and said he had never seen such a thing as that done, and would sing their praises and recommend them to everyone. Then they paid their bill and travelled farther. As they were on their way, the one with the pig's heart did not stay with them at all, but wherever there was a corner, he ran to it, and rooted about in it, with his nose as pigs do. The others wanted to hold him back by the tail of his coat, but that did no good. He tore himself loose, and ran wherever dirt was thickest. The second also behaved very strangely, he rubbed his eyes and said to the others, Comrades, what is the matter? 
I don't see it all. Will one of you lead me so that I don't fall? Then, with difficulty, they travelled on till evening. When they reached another inn, they went into the bar together, and there at a table in the corner sat a rich man counting money. The one with the thief's hand walked round about him, made a sudden movement twice with his arm, and at last, when the stranger turned away, he snatched a pile of the money and took a handful from it. One of them saw this and said, Comrade, what art thou about? Thou must not steal. Shame on thee! Eh, said he, but how can I stop myself? My hand twitches, and I am forced to snatch things whether I will or not. After this, they lay down to sleep. And while they were lying there, it was so dark that no one could see his own hand. All at once, the one with the cat's eyes awoke, aroused the others and said, Brothers, just look up. Do you see the white mice running about there? The two sat up, but could see nothing. Then said he, Things are not right with us. We have not got back again what is ours. We must return to the innkeeper. He has deceived us. They went back, therefore, the next morning, and told the host they had not got what was their own again, that the first had a thief's hand, the second cat's eyes, and the third a pig's heart. The innkeeper said that the girl must be to blame for that, and was going to call her, but when she had seen the three coming, she had run out by the back door, and not come back. Then the three said, he must give them a great deal of money, or they would set his house on fire. He gave them what he had, and whatever he could get together, and the three went away with it. It was enough for the rest of their lives. But they would rather have had their own proper organs. In ancient times a giant was wandering along the highway, when suddenly a stranger jumped toward him and shouted, Stop! Not one step further! What? said the giant. You! A creature that I could crush between my fingers! You want to block my way? Who are you that you dare to speak so boldly? I am death, answered the other one. No one resists me, and you too must obey my orders. But the giant refused, and began to wrestle with death. It was a long, violent battle, and finally the giant got the upper hand, and knocked death down with his fist, causing him to collapse by a stone. The giant went on his way, and death lay there conquered, so weak that he could not get up again. What is to come of this? he said. If I stay lying here in a corner, no one will die in the world, and it will become so filled with people that they won't have room to stand beside one another. Meanwhile, a young man came down the road, vigorous and healthy. He was singing a song and looking this way and that. Seeing the half-conscious individual, he approached him with compassion, raised him up, gave him a refreshing drink from his flask, and waited until he regained his strength. Do you know, asked the stranger as he stood up, who I am, and whom you've helped onto his legs again? No, answered the youth, I do not know you. I am death, he said. I spare no one, nor can I make an exception with you. However, so you may see that I am grateful, I promise you, that I will not attack you without warning, but instead will send my messengers to you, before I come and take you away. Good, said the youth, it is to my benefit that I shall know when you are coming, and that I will be safe from you until then. Then he went on his way, and was cheerful and carefree, and lived one day at a time. 
However, youth and good health did not last long. Soon came sickness and pain, which tormented him by day, and deprived him of his rest by night. I shall not die, he said to himself, for death will first send his messengers. But I do wish these wicked days of sickness were over. Regaining his health, he began once more to live cheerfully. Then one day someone tapped on his shoulder. He looked around and death was standing behind him, who said, Follow me, the hour of your departure from this world has come. What? replied the man. Are you breaking your word? Did you not promise me that you would send your messengers to me before you, yourself, would come? I have not seen a one of them. Be still, answered Death. Have I not sent you one messenger after another? Did not fever come and strike you, and shake you, and throw you down? Has not dizziness numbed your head? Has not gout pinched your limbs? Did your ears not buzz? Did toothache not bite into your cheeks? Did your eyes not darken? And furthermore, has not my own brother, Sleep, reminded you every night of me? During the night did you not lie there as if you were already dead? The man did not know how to answer, so he surrendered to his fate and went away with death. Once upon a time, there was a sorcerer who disguised himself as a poor man, went begging from house to house, and captured beautiful girls. No one knew where he took them, for none of them ever returned. One day, he came to the door of a man who had three beautiful daughters. He appeared to be a poor, weak beggar, and he carried a pack basket on his back as though he wanted to collect some benevolent offerings in it. He asked for a bit to eat, and when the oldest daughter came out to give him a piece of bread, he simply touched her, and she was forced to jump into his pack basket. Then he hurried away with powerful strides and carried her to his house, which stood in the middle of a dark forest. Everything was splendid in the house, and he gave her everything that she wanted. He said, My dear, you will like it here with me. You will have everything that your heart desires. So it went for a few days, and then he said to her, I have to go away and leave you alone for a short time. Here are the house keys. You may go everywhere and look at everything, except for one room that this little key here unlocks. I forbid you to go there, on the penalty of death. He also gave her an egg, saying, Take good care of this egg. You should carry it with you at all times, for if you should lose it, great misfortune would follow. She took the keys and the egg, and promised to take good care of everything. As soon as he had gone, she walked about in the house from top to bottom, examining everything. The rooms glistened with silver and gold, and she thought that she had never seen such splendor. Finally, she came to the forbidden door. She wanted to pass it by, but curiosity gave her no rest. She examined the key. It looked like any other one. She put it into the lock and twisted it a little. And then the door sprang open. What did she see when she stepped inside? A large bloody basin stood in the middle, inside which there lay the cut-up parts of dead girls. Nearby, there was a wooden block with a glistening axe lying on it. She was so terrified that the egg, which she was holding in her hand, fell into the basin. She got it out again and wiped off the blood, but it was to no avail, for it always came back. She wiped and scrubbed, but she could not get rid of the stain. 
Not long afterward, the man returned from his journey, and he immediately asked for the key and the egg. She handed them to him, shaking all the while, for he saw from the red stain that she had been in the blood chamber. You went into the chamber against my will, he said, and now against your will you shall go into it once again. Your life is finished. He threw her down, dragged her by the hair into the chamber, cut off her head on the block, then cut her up into pieces, and her blood flowed out onto the floor. Then he threw her into the basin with the others. Now, I will go get the second one, said the sorcerer. And again, disguised as a poor man, he went to their house begging. The second sister brought him a piece of bread, and, as he had done to the first one, he captured her by merely touching her, and he carried her away. It went with her no better than it had gone with her sister. She let herself be led astray by her curiosity, opened the blood chamber, and looked inside. When he returned, she paid with her life. Then he went and captured the third sister, but she was clever and sly. After he had given her the keys and the egg, and had gone away, she carefully put the egg aside and then examined the house, entering finally the forbidden chamber. Oh, what she saw! Her two dear sisters were lying there in the basin, miserably murdered and chopped to pieces. In spite of this, she proceeded to gather their parts together, placing them back in order. Head, body, arms and legs. Then, when nothing else was missing, the parts began to move. They joined together, and the two girls opened their eyes and came back to life. Rejoicing, they kissed and hugged one another. When the man returned home, he immediately demanded the keys and the egg, and when he was unable to detect any trace of blood on them, he said, You have passed the test. You shall be my bride. He now had no more power over her, and had to do whatever she demanded. Good, she answered. But first, you must take a basket full of gold to my father and mother. You, yourself, must carry it there on your back. In the meanwhile, I shall make preparations for the wedding. Then she ran to her sisters, whom she had hidden in a closet, and said, The moment is here when I can rescue you. The evildoer himself shall carry you home. As soon as you have arrived at home, send help to me. She put them both into a basket, then covered them entirely with gold, so that nothing could be seen of them. Then she called the sorcerer in and said, Now carry this basket away, but you are not to stop and rest and away. Take care, for I shall be watching you through my little window. The sorcerer lifted the basket onto his back and walked away with it. However, it pressed down so heavily on him that the sweat ran from his face. He sat down, wanting to rest, but immediately one of the girls in the basket called out, I am looking through my little window, and I can see that you are resting. Walk on! He thought that his bride was calling to him, so he got up again. Then he again wanted to sit down, but someone immediately called out, I am looking through my little window, and I can see that you are resting. Walk on! Every time that he stopped walking, someone called out, and he had to walk on until groaning and out of breath. He brought the basket with the gold and the two girls to their parents' house. At home, the bride was making preparations for the wedding feast to which she had the sorcerer's friends invited. Then she took a skull with grinning teeth, adorned it with jewellery and with a wreath of flowers, carried it to the attic window and let it look out. When everything was ready, she dipped herself into a barrel of honey, then cut open the bed 
and rolled around in it until she looked like a strange bird. And no one would have ever been able to recognize her. Then she walked out of the house. Underway, some of the wedding guests met her, and they asked, You, Fitcher's bird, where are you coming from? I am coming from the Fitcher's house. What is his young bride doing there? She has swept the house from bottom to top, and now she is looking out of the attic window. Finally, her bridegroom met her. He was slowly walking back home, and, like the others, he asked, You, Fitcher's bird, where are you coming from? I am coming from the Fitcher's house. What is my young bride doing there? She has swept the house from bottom to top, and now she is looking out of the attic window. The bridegroom looked up. Seeing the decorated skull, he thought it was his bride, and he waved a friendly greeting to her. After he and all his guests had gone into the house, the bride's brothers and relatives arrived. They had been sent to rescue her. After closing up all the doors of the house so no one could escape, they set it afire and the sorcerer, together with his gang, all burned to death. In olden times, when wishing still helped one, there lived a king whose daughters were all beautiful. But the youngest was so beautiful that the sun itself, which has seen so much, was astonished whenever it shone in her face. Close by the king's castle lay a great dark forest, and under an old lime tree in the forest was a well. And when the day was very warm, the king's child went out into the forest and sat down by the side of the cool fountain. And when she was bored, she took a golden ball and threw it up high and caught it. And this ball was her favorite plaything. Now it so happened that on one occasion the princess's golden ball did not fall into her little hand, which she was holding up for it, but on the ground beyond and rolled straight into the water. The king's daughter followed it with her eyes, but it vanished. And the well was deep, so deep that the bottom could not be seen. At this she began to cry, and cried louder and louder, and could not be comforted. And as she thus lamented, someone said to her, What ails you, king's daughter? You weep, so that even the stone should show pity. She looked round to the side, from whence the voice came, and saw a frog stretching forth its big, ugly head from the water. Ah, oh, old water splasher, is it you? She said. I am weeping for my golden ball, which has fallen into the well. Be quiet, and do not weep, answered the frog. I can help you. But what will you give me if I bring your plaything up again? Whatever you will have, dear frog, she said. My clothes, my pearls and jewels, and even my golden crown which I am wearing. The frog answered, I do not care for your clothes, your pearls and jewels, nor for your golden crown. But if you will love me and let me be your companion and playfellow, and sit by you at your little table, and eat off your golden little plate, and drink out of your little cup, and sleep in your little bed. If you will promise me this, I will go down below, and bring your golden ball up again. Oh yes, she said, I promise you, I promise you all you wish, if you will but bring my ball back again. But she thought, how the silly frog does talk. All he does is sit in the water with the other frogs and croak. He can be no companion to any human being. But the frog, when he had received this promise, 
put his head into the water and sank down, and in a short while came swimming up again with the ball in his mouth, and threw it on the grass. The king's daughter was delighted to see the pretty plaything once more, and picked it up and ran away with it. Wait, wait, said the frog. Take me with you. I can't run as you can. But what did it avail him to scream his croak, croak after her as loudly as he could? She did not listen to it, but ran home, and soon forgot the poor frog, who was forced to go back into his well again. The next day, when she had seated herself at the table, with the king and all the courtiers, and was eating from her little golden plate, something came creeping, splish, 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 splash, up the marble staircase, and when it had got to the top, it knocked at the door and cried, Princess, youngest princess, open the door for me. She ran to see who was outside, but when she opened the door, there sat the frog in front of it. Then she slammed the door in great haste, sat down to dinner again, and was quite frightened. The king saw plainly that her heart was beating violently, and said, My child, what are you so afraid of? Is there perchance a giant outside who wants to carry you away? Oh no, replied she, it is no giant, but a disgusting frog. Yesterday I was in the forest sitting by the well, playing. My golden ball fell into the water, and because I cried so, the frog brought it out again for me. And because he so insisted, I promised him he should be my companion. But I never thought he would be able to come out of his water. And now he's outside there, and wants to come in to me. In the meantime, it knocked a second time and cried, Princess, youngest princess, open the door for me. Do you not know what you said to me yesterday by the cool waters of the well? Princess, youngest princess, open the door for me. Then said the king, That which you promised must you perform. Go and let him in. She went and opened the door and the frog hopped in and followed her, step by step, to a chair. Then he sat and cried, Lift me up beside you. She delayed, until at last the king commanded her to do it. Once the frog was on the chair, he wanted to be on the table. And when he was on the table, he said, Now, push your little golden plate nearer to me, that we may eat together. She did this. But it was easy to see she did not do it willingly. The frog enjoyed what he ate, but almost every mouthful she took choked her. At length he said, I have eaten and am satisfied. Now I am tired. Carry me into your little room and make your little silken bed ready, and we will both lie down and go to sleep. The king's daughter began to cry for she was afraid of the cold frog, which she did not like to touch, and which was now to sleep in her pretty clean little bed. But the king grew angry and said, He who helped you when you were in trouble ought not afterwards to be despised by you. So she took hold of the frog with two fingers, carried him upstairs and put him in the corner. But when she was in bed, he crept to her and said, I am tired. I want to sleep as well as you. Lift me up or I will tell your father. At this she was terribly angry, and took him up and threw him with all her might against the wall. Now will you be quiet, odious frog, said she. But when he fell down he was no frog, but a king's son, with kind and beautiful eyes. He, by her father's will, was now her dear companion and husband. Then he told her how he had been bewitched by a wicked witch, and how no one could have delivered him from the well but herself, and that tomorrow they would go together into his kingdom. 
then they went to sleep. And next morning, when the sun awoke them, a carriage came driving with eight white horses, which had white ostrich feathers on their heads, and were harnessed with golden chains. And behind stood the young king's servant, Faithful Henry. Faithful Henry had been so unhappy when his master was changed into a frog, that he had caused three iron bands to be laid around his heart, lest it should burst with grief and sadness. The carriage was to conduct the young king into his kingdom. Faithful Henry helped them both in, and placed himself behind again, and was full of joy because of this deliverance. And when they had driven a part of the way, the king's son heard a cracking behind them, as if something had broken. So he turned around and cried, Henry, the carriage is breaking! No master, it is not the carriage. It is a ban from my heart, which was put there in my great pain, when you were a frog and imprisoned in the well. Again, and once again, while they were on their way, something cracked, and each time the king's son thought the carriage was breaking. But it was only the bands which were springing from the heart of faithful Henry, because his master was set free and was happy. A poor man had twelve children, and had to work day and night in order just to feed them. Thus, when the thirteenth came into the world, not knowing what to do in his need, he ran out into the highway, intending to ask the first person who he met to be the Godfather. The first person who came his way was our dear God, who already knew what was in his heart. And God said to him, Poor man, I pity you. I will hold your child at his baptism, and care for him, and make him happy on earth. The man said, Who are you? I am God. Then I do not wish you for a godfather, said the man. You give to the rich, and let the poor starve. Thus spoke the man for he did not know how wisely God divides out wealth and poverty. Then he turned away from the Lord, and went on his way. Then the devil came to him and said, What are you looking for? If you will take me as your child's godfather, I will give him an abundance of gold and all the joys of the world as well. The man asked, Who are you? I am the devil. Then I do not wish to have you for a godfather, said the man. You deceive mankind and lead them astray. He went on his way. And then death, on his withered legs, came walking toward him, and said, Take me as your child's godfather. The man asked, Who are you? I am death, who makes everyone equal. Then the man said, You are the right one. You take away the rich as well as the poor. Without distinction, you shall be my child's godfather. Death answered, I will make your child rich and famous. For he who has me for a friend cannot fail. The man said, Next Sunday is the baptism. Be there on time. Death appeared as he had promised, and served his godfather in an orderly manner. After the boy came of age, his godfather appeared to him one day, and asked him to go with him. He took him out into the woods and showed him a herb that grew there, saying, Now you shall receive your godfather's present. I will turn you into a famous physician. Whenever you are called to a sick person, I will appear to you. If I stand at the sick person's head, you may say with confidence that you can make him well again. Then give him some of this herb, and he will recover. 
But if I stand at the sick person's feet, he is mine. And you must say that he is beyond help, and that no physician in the world could save him. But beware of using this herb against my will. Something very bad will happen to you. It was not long before the young man had become the most famous physician in the whole world. People said of him, he only needs to look at the sick in order to immediately know their condition, whether they will regain their health or are doomed to die. And people came to him from far and wide, taking him to their sick, and giving him so much money that he soon became a wealthy man. Now, it came to pass that a king became ill. The physician was summoned, and was told to say if a recovery were possible. However, when he approached the bed, death was standing at the sick man's feet, and so no herb on earth would be able to help him. If I could only deceive death for once, thought the physician. He will be angry, of course, but because I am his godson, he will shut one eye. I will risk it. He therefore took hold of the sick man and laid him the other way around, so that death was now standing at his head. Then he gave the king some of the herb, and he recovered and became healthy again. However, death came to the physician, made a dark and angry face, threatened him with his finger and said, You have betrayed me. I will overlook it, this time, because you are my godson, but if you dare to do it again, it will cost you your neck, for I will take you yourself away with me. Soon afterward, the king's daughter became seriously ill. She was his only child, and he cried day and night until his eyes were going blind. Then he proclaimed that whoever rescued her from death should become her husband and inherit the crown. When the physician came to the sick girl's bed, he saw death at her feet. He should have remembered his godfather's warning. But he was so infatuated by the princess's great beauty and the prospect of becoming her husband that he threw all his thought to the winds. He did not see that death was looking at him angrily, lifting his hand into the air and threatening him with his withered fist. He lifted up the sick girl and placed her head where her feet had been. Then he gave her some of the herb, and her cheeks immediately turned red and life stirred in her once again. Death, seeing that he had been cheated out of his property for a second time, approached the physician with long strides and said, You are finished. Now it is your turn. Then Death seized him so firmly with his ice-cold hand that he could not resist and led him into an underground cavern. There the physician saw how thousands and thousands of candles were burning in endless rows, some large, others medium-sized, others small. Every instant some died out, and others were relit, so that the little flames seemed to be jumping about in constant change. See, said death, these are the lifelights of mankind. The large ones belong to children, the medium-sized ones to married people in their best years, and the little ones to old people. However, even children and young people often have only a tiny candle. Show me my lifelight, said the physician, thinking that it still would be very large. Death pointed to a little stump that was just threatening to go out and said, See, there it is. Oh, dear Godfather, said the horrified physician, light a new one for me. Do it as a favor to me, so that I can enjoy life 
and become king and husband of the beautiful princess. I cannot, answered Death. One must go out before a new one is lighted. Then set the old one onto a new one that I will go on burning after the old one is finished, begged the physician. Death pretended that he was going to fulfill this wish and took a hold of a large new candle. But, desiring revenge, he purposely made a mistake in relighting it, and the little piece fell down and went out. The physician immediately fell to the ground, and he too was now in the hands of death. There once was a miller who had one beautiful daughter, and as she was grown up, he was anxious that she should be well married and provided for. He said to himself, I will give her to the first suitable man who comes and asks for her hand. Not long after a suitor appeared, and as he appeared to be very rich, and the miller could see nothing in him with which to find fault. He betrothed his daughter to him, but the girl did not care for the man as a girl ought to care for her betrothed husband. She did not feel that she could trust him, and she could not look at him or think of him without an inward shudder. One day he said to her, You have not yet paid me a visit, although we have been betrothed for some time. I do not know where your house is, she answered. My house is out there in the dark forest, he said. She tried to excuse herself by saying that she would not be able to find the way thither. Her betrothed only replied, You must come and see me next Sunday. I have already invited guests for that day, and that you may not mistake the way, I will strew ashes along the path. When Sunday came, and it was time for the girl to start. A feeling of dread came over her, which she could not explain, and that she might be able to find her path again. She filled her pockets with peas and lentils to sprinkle on the ground as she went along. On reaching the entrance to the forest, she found the path strewed with ashes, and these she followed, throwing down some peas on either side of her at every step she took. She walked the whole day until she came to the deepest, darkest part of the forest. There she saw a lonely house, looking so grim and mysterious that it did not please her at all. She stepped inside, but not a soul was to be seen, and a great silence reigned throughout. Suddenly a voice cried, Turn back, turn back, young maiden fair. Linger not in this murderous lair. The girl looked up and saw that the voice came from a bird hanging in a cage on the wall. Again it cried, Turn back, turn back, young maiden fair. Linger not in this murderous lair. The girl passed on, going from room to room of the house. But they were all empty, and still she saw no one. At last she came to the cellar, and there sat a very, very old woman, who could not keep her head from shaking. Can you tell me, asked the girl, if my betrothed husband lives here? Ah, you poor child, answered the old woman. What a place for you to come to. This is a murderer's den. You think yourself a promised bride and that your marriage will soon take place. But it is with death that you will keep your marriage feast. Look, do you see the large cauldron of water, which I am obliged to keep on the fire? As soon as they have you in their power, they will kill you without mercy, and cook and eat you, for they are eaters of men. If I did not take pity on you, and save you, 
you would be lost. Thereupon the old woman led her behind the large cask, which quite hid her from view. Keep as still as a mouse, she said. Do not move or speak, or it will be all over with you. Tonight, when the robbers are all asleep, we will flee together. I have long been waiting for an opportunity to escape. The words were hardly out of her mouth when the godless crew returned, dragging another young girl along with them. They were all drunk and paid no heed to her cries and lamentations. They gave her wine to drink, three glasses full, one of white wine, one of red, and one of yellow. And with that, her heart gave way, and she died. Then they tore off her dainty clothing, laid her on the table, and cut her beautiful body into pieces, and sprinkled salt upon it. The poor betrothed girl crouched trembling and shuddering behind the cask, for she saw what a terrible fate had been intended for her by the robbers. One of them now noticed a gold ring, still remaining on the little finger of the murdered girl, and as he could not draw it off easily, he took a hatchet and cut off the finger. But the finger sprang into the air and fell behind the cask, into the lap of the girl who was hiding there. The robber took a light and began looking for it, but he could not find it. Have you looked behind the large cask? said one of the others. But the old woman called out, Come and eat your suppers, and let the thing be till tomorrow. The finger won't run away. The old woman is right, said the robbers, and they ceased looking for the finger and sat down. The old woman then mixed a sleeping draught with their wine, and before long they were all lying on the floor of the cellar, fast asleep and snoring. As soon as the girl was assured of this, she came from behind the cask. She was obliged to step over the bodies of the sleepers, who were lying close together, and every moment she was filled with renewed dread, lest she should awaken them. But God helped her, so that she passed safely over them. And then she and the old woman went upstairs, opened the door, and hastened as fast as they could from the murderer's den. They found the ashes scattered by the wind, but the peas and lentils had sprouted and grown sufficiently above the ground to guide them in the moonlight along the path. All night long they walked, and it was morning before they reached the mill. Then the girl told her father all that had happened. The day came that had been fixed for the marriage. The bridegroom arrived and also a large company of guests, for the miller had taken care to invite all his friends and relations. As they sat at the feast, each guest in turn was asked to tell a tale. The bride sat still and did not say a word. And you, my love, said the bridegroom, turning to her, is there a tale you know? Tell us something. I will tell you a dream then, said the bride. I went alone through a forest and came at last to a house. Not a soul could I find within, but a bird that was hanging in a cage on the wall cried, Turn back, turn back, young maiden fair, linger not in this murderous lair. And again the second time it said these words. My darling, this was only a dream. I went through the house from room to room, but they were all empty, and everything was so grim and mysterious. At last I went down to the cellar, and there sat a very, very old woman, who could not keep her head still. I asked her if my betrothed lived here, and she answered, Ah, you poor child, you have come to a murderer's den. Your betrothed does not indeed live here, but he will kill you without mercy, and afterwards cook and eat you. My darling, this is only a dream. The old woman hid me behind a large cask, 
and scarcely had she done this when the robbers returned home. Dragging a young girl along with them, they gave her three kinds of wine to drink, white, red and yellow, and with that she died. My darling, this is only a dream. Then they tore off her dainty clothing and cut her beautiful body into pieces and sprinkled salt upon it. My darling, this is only a dream. And one of the robbers saw that there was a gold ring still left on her finger, and as it was difficult to draw off, he took a hatchet and cut off the finger, but the finger sprang into the air and fell behind the great cask into my lap. And here is the finger with the ring. And with these words, the bride drew forth the finger and showed it to the assembled guests. The bridegroom, who during this recital had grown deadly pale, up and tried to escape, but the guests seized him and held him fast. They delivered him up to justice, and he and all his murderous band were condemned to death for their wicked deeds. There once lived a man and his wife, who had long wished for a child, but in vain. Now, there was at the back of the house a little window which overlooked a beautiful garden of the finest vegetables and flowers, but there was a high wall around it, and no one ventured into it, for it belonged to a witch of great might, and of whom all the world was afraid. One day that wife was standing at the window, and looking into the garden, she saw a bed filled with the finest rampion, and it looked so fresh and green that she began to wish for some, and at length she longed for it greatly. This went on for days, and she knew she could not get the rampion. She pined away and grew pale and miserable. Then the man was uneasy and asked, What is the matter, dear wife? Oh, answered she, I shall die unless I can have some of that rampion to eat that grows in the garden at the back of our house. The man who loved her very much thought to himself, rather than lose my wife, I will get the rampion, cost what it will. So in the twilight, he climbed over the wall into the witch's garden, plucked hastily a handful of rampion and brought it to his wife. She made a salad of it at once and ate it to her heart's content. But she liked it so much, and it tasted so good, that the next day she longed for it thrice as much as she had done before. If she was to have any rest, the man must climb over the wall once more. So he went into the twilight again, and as he was climbing back, he saw, all at once, the witch standing before him, and was terribly frightened. As she cried with angry eyes, How dare you climb over into my garden like a thief and steal my rampion? It shall be the worse for you. Oh, answered he, be merciful rather than just. I have only done it through the necessity, for my wife saw your rampion out the window and became possessed with so great a longing that she could have died if she could not have had some to eat. Then the witch said, if it's all as you say, you may have as much rampion as you like, on one condition. The child that will come into the world must be given to me. It shall go well with the child, and I will care for it like a mother. In his distress of mind, the man promised everything, and when the time came when the child was born, the witch appeared, and giving the child the name of Rapunzel, she took it away with her. Rapunzel was the most beautiful child in the world. When she was twelve years old, the witch shut her up in a tower in the midst of a wood, and it had neither steps nor door, only a small window above. When the witch wished to be let in, she would stand below and would cry, Rapunzel, Rapunzel, let down your hair. Rapunzel had beautiful long hair that shone like gold. When she heard the voice of the witch, she would undo the fastenings of the upper window, 
unbind the plaits of her hair, and let it down twenty else below, and the witch would climb up by it. After they had lived thus a few years, it happened that the king's son was riding through the wood. He came to the tower, and as he drew near, he heard a voice singing so sweetly that he stood still and listened. It was Rapunzel, in her loneliness, trying to pass away the time with sweet songs. The king's son wished to go in to her, and sought to find a door in the tower, but there was none. So he rode home, but the song had entered into his heart, and every day he went into the wood and listened to it. Once, as he was standing under a tree, he saw the witch come up, and listened while she called out, Oh, Rapunzel, Rapunzel, let down your hair. Then he saw how Rapunzel let down her tresses, and how the witch climbed up by it, and went in to her. And he said to himself, Since that is the ladder, I will climb it, and seek my fortune. And the next day, as soon as it began to grow dusk, he went to the tower and cried, Oh, Rapunzel, Rapunzel, let down your hair. And she let down her hair, and the king's son climbed up by it. Rapunzel was greatly terrified when she saw that a man had come into her, for she had never seen one before. But the king's son began speaking so kindly to her, and told how her singing had entered into his heart, so that he could have no peace until he had seen her herself. Then Rapunzel forgot her terror, and when he asked her to take him for her husband, and she saw that he was young and beautiful. She thought to herself, I certainly like him much more than the old mother Gothel, and she put her hand into his hand. She said, I would willingly go with thee, but I do not know how I shall get out when thou comest. Bring each time a silken rope, and I will make a ladder, and when it's quite ready, I will get down by it, out of the tower, and thou shalt take me on thy horse. They agreed that he should come to her every evening, as the old woman came in the daytime. So the witch knew nothing of all this, until once Rapunzel said to her unwittingly, Mother Gothel, how is it that you climb up here so slowly, and the king's son is with me in a moment? Oh, wicked child, cried the witch, what is this I hear? I thought I had hidden thee from all the world, and thou hast betrayed me. In her anger, she seized Rapunzel by her beautiful hair, struck her several times with her left hand, and then grasping a pair of shears in her right. Snip, snap, the beautiful locks lay on the ground, and she was so hard-hearted that she took Rapunzel and put her in a waste and desert place, where she lived in great woe and misery. The same day on which she took Rapunzel away, she went back to the tower in the evening, and made fast the severed locks of hair to the window. Hasp! And the king's son came and cried, Rapunzel, Rapunzel, let down your hair! Then she let the hair down, and the king's son climbed up. But instead of his dearest Rapunzel, he found the witch looking at him with wicked, glittering eyes. Ha! cried she, mocking him. You came for your darling. But the sweet bird sits no longer in the nest, and sings no more. The cat has got her, and will scratch out her eyes as well. Rapunzel is lost to you. You will see her no more. The king's son was beside himself with grief, and in his agony he sprang from the tower. He escaped with his life, but the thorns on which he fell put out his eyes. Then he wandered blind through the wood, eating nothing but roots and berries, and doing nothing but lament and weep for the loss of his dearest wife. So he wandered several years in misery, until at last he came to a desert place, where Rapunzel lived with her twin children that she had born, a boy and a girl. At first he heard a voice that he thought he knew, and when he reached the place from which it seemed to come, Rapunzel knew him, and fell on his neck and wept. And when her tears touched his eyes, they became clear again, and he could see with them as well as ever. Then he took her to his kingdom, 
where he was received with great joy, and there they lived long and happily. A man and his wife were once sitting by the door of their house, and they had a roasted chicken set before them, and were about to eat it together. Then the man saw that his aged father was coming, and hastily took the chicken and hid it, for he would not permit him to have any of it. The old man came, took a drink, and went away. Now the son wanted to put the roasted chicken on the table again. But when he took it up, it had become a great toad, which jumped into his face and sat there, and never went away again. And if anyone wanted to take it off, it looked venomously at him, as if it would jump into his face, so that no one would venture to touch it. And the ungrateful son was forced to feed the toad every day, or else it fed itself on his face. And thus he went about the world without knowing rest. In former times there lived an aged queen who was a sorceress, and her daughter was the most beautiful maiden under the sun. The old woman, however, had no other thought than how to lure mankind to destruction, and when a wooer appeared, she said that whoever wished to have her daughter must perform a task or die. Many had been dazzled by the daughter's beauty, and had actually risked this, but they never could accomplish what the old woman enjoined them to do, and then no mercy was shown. They had to kneel down, and their head was struck off. A certain king's son, who had also heard of the maiden's beauty, said to his father, Let me go there, I want to demand her in marriage. Never, answered the king. If you were to go, it would be going to your death. On this the son lay down, and was sick unto death, and for seven years he lay there, and no physician could heal him. When the father perceived that all hope was over, with a heavy heart he said to him, Go thither, and try your luck, for I know no other means of curing you. When the son heard that, he rose from his bed, and was well again, and joyfully said on his way, and it came to pass that as he was riding across a heath, he saw from afar something like a great heap of hay lying on the ground. And when he drew nearer, he could see it was the stomach of a man who had laid himself down there. But the stomach looked like a small mountain. When the fat man saw the traveler, he stood up and said, If you are in need of anyone, take me into your service. The prince answered, what can I do with such a great big man? Oh, said the stout one, this is nothing. When I stretch myself out, well, I'm three thousand times fatter. If that's the case, said the prince, I can make use of thee, come with me. So the stout one followed the prince, and after a while they found another man, who was lying on the ground, with his ear laid to the turf. What art thou doing there? asked the king's son. I am listening, replied the man. What art thou listening to so attentively? I am listening to what is going on in the world, for nothing escapes my ear. I even hear the grass growing. Tell me, said the prince, what thou hearest at the court of the old queen who has the beautiful daughter. Then he answered, I hear the whizzing of the sword that is striking off a wooer's head. The king's son said, I can make use of thee, come with me. They went onwards, and they saw a pair of feet lying, and part of a pair of legs, but they could not see the rest of the body. When they had walked on for a great distance, they came to the body, and at last the head. Why, said the prince, what a tall rascal thou art. Oh, replied the tall one, that is nothing at all yet. When I really stretch out my limbs, 
I am 3,000 times as tall, and taller than the highest mountain on earth. I will gladly enter your service if you will take me. Come with me, said the prince. I can make use of thee. They went onwards and found a man sitting by the road, who had bound up his eyes. The prince said to him, Hast thou weak eyes that thou canst not look at the light? No, replied the man, but I must not remove the bandage, for whatsoever I look at with my eyes splits to pieces. My glance is so powerful. If you can use that, I shall be glad to serve you. Come with me, replied the king's son. I can make use of thee. They journeyed onwards and found a man who still was lying in the hot sunshine, trembling and shivering all over his body, so that not a limb was still. How canst thou shiver when the sun is shining so warm? said the king's son. Alack, replied the man, I am of quite a different nature. The hotter it is, the colder I am, and the frost pierces through all my bones, and the colder it is, the hotter I am, in the midst of ice. I cannot endure the heat, nor in the midst of fire the cold. Thou art a strange fellow, said the prince, but if thou wilt enter my service, follow me. They travelled onwards, and saw a man standing, who made a long neck and looked about him, and could see over all the mountains. What art thou looking at so eagerly? said the king's son. The man replied, I have such sharp eyes that I can see into every forest and field, and hill and valley, all over the world. The prince said, Come with me if thou wilt, for I am still in want of such a one. And now the king's son and his six servants came to the town where the aged queen dwelt. He did not tell her who he was, but said, If you will give me your beautiful daughter, I will perform any task you set me. The sorceress was delighted to get such a handsome youth as this into her net, and said, I will set three tasks, and if thou art able to perform them all, Thou shalt be husband and master of my daughter. What is the first to be? Thou shalt fetch me my ring, which I have dropped into the Red Sea. So the king's son went home to his servants and said, The first task is not easy. A ring is to be got out of the Red Sea. Come, find some way of doing it. Then the man with sharp sight said, I will see where it is lying, and looked down into the water and said, it is there, it is sticking there on a pointed stone. The tall one carried them thither and said, I would soon get it out if I could only see it. Oh, is that all, cried the stout one. And laying down, put his mouth to the water, on which all the waves fell into it, just as if it had been a whirlpool, and he drank up the whole sea, till it was as dry as a meadow. The tall one stooped down a little, and brought out the ring with his hand. Then the king's son rejoiced when he had the ring, and he took it to the old queen. She was astonished, and said, Yes, it is the right ring. Thou hast safely performed the first task, and now cometh the second. Dost thou see the meadow in front of my palace? Three hundred fat oxen are feeding there, and these must thou eat, skin, hair, bones, horns, and all and down below in my cellar lie three hundred casks of wine, and these thou must drink up as well. And if one hair of the oxen, or one little drop of the wine, is left, thy life will be forfeited to me. May I invite no guests to this repast? inquired the prince. No dinner is good without some company. The old woman laughed maliciously, and replied, Thou mayst invite one, for the sake of companionship, but no more. The king's son went to his servants, and said to the stout one, Thou shalt be my guest today, and shall eat thy fill. Hereupon the stout one stretched himself out, and ate three hundred oxen, without leaving one single hair. And then he asked, if he was to have nothing but his breakfast. He drank the wine straight from the casks, 
without feeling any need of a glass, and he licked the last drop from his fingernails. When the meal was over, the prince went to the old woman, and told her the second task was also performed. She wondered at this, and said, No one has ever done so much before, but one task still remains. And she thought to herself, Thou shalt not escape me, and wilt not keep thy head on thy shoulders this night. Said she, I will bring my daughter to thee in thy chamber, and thou shalt put thine arms round her. But when you are sitting there together, beware of falling asleep. When twelve o'clock is striking, I will come, and if she is then no longer in thine arms, thou art lost. The prince thought, The task is easy. I will most certainly keep my eyes open. Nevertheless, he called his servants, told them what the old woman had said, and remarked, Who knows what treachery lurks behind this? Foresight is a good thing, keep watch, and take care that the maiden does not go out of my room again. When the night fell, the old woman came with her daughter, and gave her into the prince's arms. And then the tall one wound himself round the two in a circle, and the stout one placed himself by the door, so that no living creature could enter. There the two sat, and the maiden spark never a word, but the moon shone through the window on her face, and the prince could behold her wondrous beauty. He did nothing but gaze at her, and was filled with love and happiness, and his eyes never felt weary. This lasted until eleven o'clock, when the old woman cast such a spell over all of them that they fell asleep, and at the selfsame moment, the maiden was carried away. Then they all slept soundly until quarter to twelve, when the magic lost its power, and all awoke again. Oh, misery and misfortune, cried the prince, now I am lost. The faithful servants also began to lament. But the listener said, Be quiet, I want to listen. Then he listened for an instant, and said, She is on a rock three hundred leagues from hence, bewailing her fate. Thou alone, tall one, canst help her. If thou wilt stand up, thou wilt be there in a couple of steps. Yes, answered the tall one, but the one with sharp eyes must go with me, that we may destroy the rock. Then the tall one took the one with bandaged eyes on his back, and in the twinkling of an eye they were on the enchanted rock. The tall one immediately took the bandage from the other's eyes, and he did but look around, and the rock shivered into a thousand pieces. Then the tall one took the maiden in his arms, carried her back in a second, then fetched his companion with the same rapidity, and before it struck twelve, they were all sitting as they had sat before, quite merrily and happily. When twelve struck, the aged sorceress came stealing in with a malicious face, which seemed to say, now he's mine, for she believed that her daughter was on the rock three hundred leagues off. But when she saw her in the prince's arms, she was alarmed, and said, here is one who knows more than I do. She dared not make any opposition, and was forced to give him her daughter. But she whispered in her ear, It is a disgrace to thee to have to obey common people, and that thou art not allowed to choose a husband of thine own liking. On this the proud heart of the maiden was filled with anger, and she meditated revenge. Next morning she caused three hundred great bundles of wood to be got together, and said to the prince, that though the three tasks were performed, she would still not be his wife, until someone was ready to seat himself in the midst of the wood and bear the fire. She thought that none of his servants would let themselves be burnt for him, and that out of love for her, he himself would place himself upon it, and then she would be free. But the servant said, every one of us has done something, except the frosty one, he must set to work. And they put him in the middle of the pile and set fire to it. 
Then the fire began to burn, and burned for three days until all the wood was consumed. And when the flames had burned out, the Frosty One was standing amid the ashes, trembling like an aspen leaf, and saying, I have never felt such frost during the whole course of my life. If it had lasted much longer, I should have been benumbed. As no other pretext was to be found, the beautiful maiden was forced to take the unknown youth as a husband. But when they drove away to church, the old woman said, I cannot endure the disgrace, and sent her warriors after them, with orders to cut down all who opposed them, and bring back her daughter. But the listener had sharpened his ears, and heard the secret discourse of the old woman. What shall we do? said he to the stout one. But he knew what to do, and spat out once or twice behind the carriage some of the sea water which he had drunk, and a great sea arose in which the warriors were caught and drowned. When the sorceress perceived that, she sent her mailed knights, but the listener heard the rattling of their armor, and undid the bandage from one eye of sharp eyes, who looked for a while rather fixedly at the enemy troops, on which they all sprang to pieces like glass. Then the youth and the maiden went on their way undisturbed. And when the two had been blessed in church, the six servants took leave and said to their master, Your wishes are now satisfied. You need us no longer. We will go our way and seek our fortunes. Half a league from the palace of the prince's father was a village, near which a swineherd tended his herd. And when they came thither, the prince said to his wife, Do you know who I really am? I am no prince, but a herder of swine. And the man who is there with that herd is my father. We too shall have to set to work also, and help him. Then he alighted with her at the inn, and secretly told the innkeeper to take away her royal April during the night. So when she awoke in the morning, she had nothing to put on, and the innkeeper's wife gave her an old gown and a pair of worsted stockings, and at the same time seemed to consider it a great present. If it were not for the sake of your husband, I should have given you nothing at all. Then the princess believed that he really was a swineherd, and tended the herd with him, and thought to herself, I have deserved this for my heartiness and pride. This lasted for a week, and then she could endure no longer, for she had sores on her feet. And now came a couple of people who asked if she knew who her husband was. Yes, she answered, he is a swineherd, and has just gone out with cords and ropes to try and drive a little bargain. But they said, just come with us, and we'll take you to him. And they took her up to the palace. And when she entered the hall, there stood her husband in kingly raiment. But she did not recognize him until he took her in his arms, kissed her, and said, I suffered much for thee, and now thou too hast had to suffer for me. And then the wedding was celebrated, and he who had told you all of this wishes that he too had been present at it. There once was a shoemaker who worked very hard and was very honest, but still he could not earn enough to live upon, and at last all he had in the world was gone, save just leather enough to make one pair of shoes. Then he cut his leather out 
all ready to make up the next day, meaning to rise early in the morning to his work. His conscience was clear, and his heart light amidst all his troubles, so he went peacefully to bed, left all his cares to heaven, and soon fell asleep. In the morning after he had said his prayers, he sat himself down to his work, when, to his great wonder, there stood the shoes already made upon the table. The good man knew not what to say or think at such an odd thing happening. He looked at the workmanship. There was not one false stitch in the whole job. All was so neat and true and it was quite a masterpiece. The same day, a customer came in, and the shoes suited him so well that he willingly paid a price higher than usual for them. And the poor shoemaker, with the money, bought leather enough to make two pairs more. In the evening he cut out the work, and went to bed early, that he might get up and begin betimes next day. But he was saved all the trouble, for when he got up in the morning, the work was done ready to his hand. Soon in came buyers, who paid him handsomely for his goods, so that he bought leather enough for four pair more. He cut the work out again overnight, and found it done in the morning, as before. And so it went on for some time. What was got ready in the evening? was always done by daybreak, and the good man soon became thriving and well off again. One evening, about Christmas time, as he and his wife were sitting over the fire, chatting together, he said to her, I should like to sit up and watch tonight, that we may see who it is that comes and does my work for me. The wife liked the thought, so they left a light burning, and hid themselves in the corner of the room, behind a curtain that was hung up there, and watched what would happen. As soon as it was midnight, there came in two little naked dwarfs, and they sat themselves upon the shoemaker's bench, took up all the work that was cut out, and began to ply with their little fingers stitching and rapping and tapping away at such a rate that the shoemaker was all a wonder and could not take his eyes off them. And on they went till the job was quite done and the shoes stood ready for use upon the table. This was long before daybreak and they bustled away as quick as lightning. The next day the wife said to the shoemaker, these little whites have made us rich and we ought to be thankful to them, and do them a good turn if we can. I am quite sorry to see them run about as they do, and indeed it is not very decent, for they have nothing upon their backs to keep off the cold. I'll tell you what, I will make each of them a shirt and a coat and a waistcoat, and a pair of pantaloons into the bargain. And do you make each of them a little pair of shoes? The thought pleased the good cobbler very much, and one evening, when all the things were ready, they laid them on the table instead of the work they used to cut out, and then went and hid themselves to watch what the little elves would do. About midnight in they came, dancing and skipping hopped round the room, and then went to sit down to do their work as usual. But when they saw the clothes lying for them, they laughed and chuckled, and seemed mightily delighted. Then they dressed themselves in the twinkling of an eye, and danced and capered and sprang about, as merry as it could be, till at last they danced out of the door and away over the green. The good couple saw them no more, but everything went well with them from that time forward, as long as they lived.